Okay, I'm going to get started if that's all right. No. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Uh, I can see some familiar names, and so it's really nice to have those people on board and new people as well. Uh, Zoom is a funny thing right now because we've actually just been to an exhibition and the factory project uh, for which, you know, obviously Trace Elements 1971 is part of that we're going to talk about this evening. Uh, it was like a celebration of just sheer joy. It was such a palpable sense of um, the excitement of art and of being in public together it was really strange. Anyway, for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm Gillian Knipe. Uh, I'm an artist and an art critic and also founder of Art Fiction's podcast. And Rosalind has been a guest on Art Fiction's podcast, as has Andrea Wright. So you might have heard that before. Uh, of course, welcome to the artists. Uh, we have this evening, and perhaps we could little, have little hand waves um, from Andrea Wright mm -hmm. and Fabio Almeida, Hermione Alsop, Justin Hibbs, Rosalind Davis. Lex Shoot, Lisa Traxler, Richard Perry, and Sasha Bowles. And just in case anybody's come in late uh, with regards to admin, there's questions in the question in the chat box, but also we'll turn mute off later and uh, for question time. Um, so trace elements, uh, which is part of the exhibition's title. Uh, before 1971. I think it's particularly interesting considering where we've come from and that persistence of COVID, you know, going to see the exhibition in itself is a trace of what we've all come out of, you know, opening the doors up and opening the doors up to quite an extensive display as well. And that is also happening in our minds quite slowly and in a faltering sort of slightly anxious way, I think. Anyway, I think at this point, it might be a good idea to hand over to Rosalind, uh, who's going to talk a little bit more about where the concept stems from and the significance of 1971. Well, welcome, everyone. And thank you um, to you, Gillian, for hosting this and all the amazing research. I'm not sure what's happening to the video on the other side, but I'm just playing um, an install shot. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully you can kind of see a little bit of the show um, that I've curated um, at the factory, which was produced by um, Thorpe Stavbury, who invited 10 curatorial groups um, to come and put on a show within a space as an alternative to freeze, really. Um, and so I was really chuffed to be asked. Um, and so the, the start of the kind of show for me, um, in terms of thinking about the name um, is Trace Elements 1971 was um, thinking about the building um, as a catalyst to the idea of the curating, essentially. Um, and then from that point on, um, 1971, Justin's going to talk about because he's got the T-shirt, um, but um, this idea of a building containing so much history. So this was a, a factory that was built in 1878. Um, and I was interested in its kind of lineage and its industrial history and its kind of, uh, I suppose, the the ghosts that are in it, but without calling it ghosts, but trace elements of, of the lives that have been there before. And so with the artists that I chose for the show, um, it was thinking about the way that they transform um, or, or kind of use experiential spaces. Um, they respond directly to buildings or contexts, not necessarily buildings directly, um, but scraping back layers of history, materiality, or indeed reality um, to create new alternate spaces, objects, and environments. So everyone made pretty much, well, it was site specifically placed. Um, and uh, <clears throat> this idea of having this cumulative aspect of time in the works as well, and reigniting the space and reactivating it, I think. Um, so I think it's very layered in its history and uh, the artists are also using, well, the works in the show, they have a kind of industrial format really in terms of the materials they're using, whether that's steel or foam or wood or steel. 
um, or paper even, you know, with um, with people's works and stained glass. So that was kind of one of my sort of mulling over who to ask and how they, they would kind of have a conversation with the works together. Um, and I think there's the 1971 and the collision of time, as I say, Justin's going to mention about, um, but it was something that was in fact a joke because Justin was wearing this t-shirt when we first went to see the site um, and uh, we thought that would be quite an enigmatic title but then I started researching what had happened in 1971 which I'll go into a little bit later um, but yeah and it's it's very much about the context of the building and activating it and having the conversations with the artists within it as well so everything was kind of very carefully considered in terms of the curatorial ideas as well as the actual physical placing of of the artwork oh and also the other thing i was going to say is that all of the other trace elements factor is um my grandfather was a um sort of quite a, a he was like a managing kind of chief something i've forgotten um that worked in job. <laughs> yeah he had a job uh, he was somewhere high up um and he used to work in tate and Lyle. my mum's first job was working in the canteen of tate and Lyle, um and now i'm working in tate and Lyle. <laughs> so um i think that's kind of kind of feels very resonant and very pertinent as well to me um and the sort of relationship to the building it's sort of like my mother would have walked through here or my grandfather and then as i've sort of talked to people other people have said oh my my dad used to work there in that factory and and so there's kind of as I say these trace elements of relationships to to a building and the the activities that went on in those buildings and the people that inhabited those buildings and all those stories somehow are wrapped up in everything that we're all doing as well but yeah so it's 1878 1971 and 2021 are sort of these colliding dates um there's also an exhibition that is born out of conversations not final statements and it will kind of will continue to evolve, not literally, you know, we're going to move things around, but with the artists and 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 with this conversation here and now in terms of the the resonance and the residue of all these different memories and think, thoughts and feelings. I think that's an amazing coincidence uh, <laughs> that those stories, that's incredible. And it leads very nicely into a quote I have pulled out, which I couldn't resist, uh, a book quote. Uh, by Rena Maria Rilke from Notebooks of Malta Lawrence Briggs. And he's talking about his grandfather's house and his experience in his grandfather's house. And he says, in the memories I have in, in the memories I have of it, shaped as they were by a child's understanding, it is not a building. To my mind, it consists of discrete parts. Here a room, there a room, and here a stretch of passageway that does not connect with these two rooms, but is preserved in isolation as a fragment. In this way, it is all dispersed within me, the rooms, the staircases that descended with such elaborate ceremony and other tight spiral stairs where one passed through the dark as the blood passes through the veins. All of these things are still within me and will never cease to be in me. And I thought that was particularly poignant. As soon as uh, Rosalind spoke to me about uh, hosting this discussion, because, and, and this is gonna come out more and more in the conversation and perhaps particularly with regards to Sasha Bowles's work, is the idea of the building in itself and the building's interaction with people and the people's interaction with building and the sort of traces that each marks on the other. But perhaps to, start uh, us off at, in 1971, where just, when, which is when Justin Hibbs also started. Um, I might hand over to you, Justin, to talk about the significance of that year and your thinking about your work in this space as well. Yeah, well, I suppose it's an interesting question um, for obviously for me personally, but also for, for the exhibition, because, you know, I was born in 1971, so I'm 50 years old and this kind of almost accidentally it's at first as Ros mentioned um ended up becoming quite an, an important time period to contextualize this show thinking about this building that's much older from the victorian period and it's sort of rich industrial life that it's had um 
but in in one of our first visits to the factory as a group of artists we were we kind of visited the building and i suppose we were all really um taken with this kind of the presence of this building and its history and we were already thinking about this idea of time and we were having a drink afterwards and a discussion about the show and i happened to be wearing this t-shirt because it's my birth year and uh oh, lots of other things and so sasha just says you know why don't we call it 1971 which although at that point felt fairly left field and um sort of super ambiguous as we kind of went on to think about that it kind of and, and research that year we thought actually this is a really interesting context or lens to sort of think about the show um you know it so it's, it's took hold as an idea uh, as a sort of alternate context because you know we're existing now in this in the digital age and 1971 happens to be the year that the first microprocessors became commercially available so actually it gets cited as the very very start really of the true digital era which is where home computing starts and this is you know is where we are now really the, the kind of evolution of that you know so like in 82 i get my first zx spectrum and i'm you know a computer that you have to put tapes in and you heard those funny sounds as you loaded up a crap game um <laughs> you know, by, the t by the time i go to art school in the early 90s we still only have like eight apple macs in a room so it's a very slow evolution at first but actually we began to think about this idea of um the artists in the show the context of the building but the kind of works that those artists make and how they respond to spaces and the kind of materials of their work so if you kind of think as ros listed of the kind of materials in the show you know your glass steel um people that are really interested in materials and the material qualities of objects and this is quite interesting considering we're in this digital era and i think for most of us perhaps we're a similar generation you know ros is maybe at the younger end being born in the 80s but a lot of us maybe born late 60s through <laughs> the 70s i don't want to insult anyone in the show. <laughs> um, but I, I think that's interesting because it puts us on sort of both sides of a divide in a funny way we're, we're of that time um we, we're born into the digital era but at the same time um i kind of feel that you know like when i went to art school and we only had a few macs i was still dealing with photocopiers and cut and paste and physical materials and physical ways of doing graphic design so i always think of artworks as material objects and their qualities um which is so different to my kids who were born right into the digital era they're totally submerged in technology and phones and so in a way i think it gives us this context to think about material object and qualities and the resonance with this building um so that's where the kind of two parts of that title come from um and just to add to that um because I wanted Justin to introduce the 1971 aspect, but um, when I was doing the research about, I looked up everything that had happened in the year 1971, and it was the year that Disneyland opened. <clears throat> and I was really, a lot of the artists are using metamorphosis and transformation, as I said, um, illusion, experience, environment. And I, again, it's sort of, originally these were hand-drawn, you know, uh, stock frame animations, almost practically. And how that's now evolved that we can even, do gifts on our phone. Um, but I like the idea of that sense of wonder that I wanted to bring to the space with the artworks as well, that they would um, have that a magical element, I suppose. Um, so yeah, that's another reference to 1971. And somebody landed on the moon, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> apparently. <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> um so that's a, so i'm just going to pick up on what justin was saying about the materiality of the building um and that's something that andrea wright has worked with uh quite a lot before either of uh large objects or of buildings themselves and this is not um a this is a new take for you andrea on working with a building but you have actually worked with a building before and considered the um, the walls of um, factories and the remnants from a working factory. So obviously there's the people who worked in the factory themselves, 
and what they might have done in building those walls and they're sort of again I think ghosts is going to come up a lot I you know obviously I don't mean um, nightmare on Elm Street kind of stuff but you know a, a sense a spiritual sense um, for a shortcut word let's say uh, and also um, the you know the, these walls which uh, Fabio and Andrea have particularly um, taken advantage of, and I'd say Hermione's work kind of jumps out from them as well, have the most extraordinary um, materiality to them within their own right. They are, you know, art pieces within their own right. But I can imagine all the, you know, sort of muck and stuff that would have gone into shaping them uh, that way. And Andrew, you've sort of created a skin for them and pulled that off the wall. Do you want to talk a little bit about your process for that? Hi, Gillian. Um, yes, yeah, so the process, the title, I'm just going to touch on the title of the work, which was um, Freedom of Disso Dissociation, which is a play on um, a, uh, a government body called the Freedom Association who were corrupt and disruptive um, body who were very much against the power of the unions and very much wanted to um, control um, workers' rights and um, uh, the sense of, um, you know, really holding them back of their voice. So, I approached the work using liquid latex, which is a trans uh, amazing material that transforms from liquid into a solid skin. And in this work, as you can see on the image on the left, the pigments I had in this um, in in this first layer were all pigments I'd found around the building. So colors I'd seen either in the peeling wall or other parts of the site. So the process is layering the liquid uh, that's mixed with pigments and, and other additives and letting that dry and then putting another layer on and another layer on until you finally peel it away. And I guess there's something in that, you know, layering and the kind of burying the surface beneath the very various layers and then releasing it is this feeling of, you know, uh, disassociating it. But the, at the same time, the resulting surface is embedded with, you know, all sorts of um, with the, the surface itself, the layers of the paint, which had cut, been covered and painted over the years, because I found very a lot of different pigments in that wall. Um, and there's that feeling of, you know, releasing it from, you know, part of history, you know, a sense of evidence or an artifact that um, is it has it's like I said embedded is that that kind of word where it's embedded with you know could be skin or all sorts of you know um, elements of dust and you know I really felt like we all did when we visited that site you know that sense of history there that sense of you know place frozen in time neglected over the years and um, I really wanted to to take a latex imprint that, as you know, Gillian, I've taken many before. So I wanted to make this one slightly different by using these pigments. Yeah, I mean, it, it's also, we know from cave paintings as well that uh, DNA becomes embedded in, in the um, surface because we as humans, just by being present in caves, <laughs> ruin all the, um, all the cave paintings. And just quickly, because we've got quite a lot of artists to get through, um, tell me about your chair, your higgledy piggledy chair composition. Well, I shouldn't say chair, but um, your, <laughs> your pickup <laughs> stick <laughs> collection. So the chair is a, a design um, from an architect called Eric Lyons, and it was mass produced, I think, in its, in its simplicity, it was mass produced as a stacking chair that was very often used in schools, factories, canteens, community centers. So in one way, it has a resonance with the site in the sense of mass production, um, the mass production of, of sugar, etc. 
Um, and then it's also a bit of a homage to my experience through lockdown and finding um, lots of objects that have been fly tipped because the um, recycling centers were closed. So I'd started with a, using this a chair during lockdown. So I then sourced a number of these chairs um, through a online site very cheaply from an old school and they were already perishing. So I did, didn't feel too bad about completely um, dismembering them, um, deconstructing them. You know, I was thinking about the limb, the element of chairs being like limbs, the legs of the chairs, the arms of the chairs and this sense of deconstructing and reconstructing them in a semi, something about the figure in it, I guess, or that sense of direction, mm. um, that sense of reaching, moving back in on itself, that organic. And then within there are some fleshy clay-like forms that I made um, again during lockdown, which hint at the sense of um, the material body and the relationships with how we sit in chairs, communicate, and, and a sense of celebrating the community, because uh, Tate and Lyle did have a community project nearby. And I just sort of imagined them coming together, um, you know, sitting in circles. And I wanted to, you know, touch on that as well as part of the, the influence. The and they're world. very beautiful sort of ca candy um, uh, pastel colours as well. And you've got this way of, I, I think in terms of um, the title trace elements, uh, I, I connect your work with a way of uh, sort of creating a, a real or imagined lineage through um, from the object or the wall or the architecture through, through to the material. Um, Whereas I'm going to move on to Fabio now, um, who is probably looking at trace in a slightly different way, which is uh, throughout one's experience and almost like a testament, I think, to personal presence. Um, so Fabio is very interested in the urban landscape and the way in which we negotiate with our physical surrounds and his collages for me have that way of, um, I, I guess, depicting snippets of the spaces in between the edges of urban landscape. Um, you know, the, you, you some, some one object might be a curved edge, one object might be a, a sharp edge, and then here we see those sort of shapes appearing on his canvases. Um, and maybe Fabio, you can talk a little bit about that and the sort of flattening out that happens when you when you put them on a on a two dimensional um, object or canvas. Mm -hmm. But also, um, you've done something slightly differently this time. You've created a series of cubes. So maybe you could tell us how they came about. That's a kind of new move. Um, hi, Janet. Yeah, um, absolutely. Very well. Uh, put there. Thanks very much uh, about my work there, and I'm very much interested in this uh, in the way that um, I read our landscape and our cityscapes and the objects within it, um, and the way that they come together. Uh, and uh, so those two collages there, they're in the show. They they are response to 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 the way that uh, I saw images of the space that the show was taking place. I uh, in the end, I couldn't come to any of the visits, so I relied on on images and stories that um, I heard about the the actual space, and I decided to to then uh, come up with those uh, two works that, for me, kind of read into or tap into some of the um, uh, the history and and also the physicality of the building that, for me, uh, it is very important in my work. And the cubes they come slightly later once I had been to the space and I'd seen the space. And I decided to create something that had more of a physical presence. Uh, and again, just responding to, to how I felt about being there and, and other people's works as well. You know, uh, something that I'm interested in, in, in looking and, and reading and then um, uh, responding to, to what I see. And uh, so they very much keep within the language that I use in, in my paintings, mm -hmm. but it's just a three dimensional um, uh, 
response to, to what I see. Yeah, absolutely. And you were talking to me about moving through, I mean, I don't know whether you cycle um, uh, through um, the London, for instance. I don't uh, cycle, I walk a lot and, and I drive. Yeah. <laughs> I do both, <laughs> unfortunately, I do drive. And um, yeah, I think I was talking to you about the way that things, they just pass by and, and the way that yeah. we read things very fleetingly and, and, and the way that we can... And those things, they kind of stay in your mind. Uh, they might uh, disappear very quickly. They might, some, some other things that just stay. And also the way the things, they um, relate to each other. I'm very interested in, in relationships, uh, physical, visual relationships between uh, objects and, and, and just like visual language. What you see it could be anything. It could be a, a piece of a wall with a, with a bit of graffiti. But then again, next to that, there'll be a, uh, the side of a building, which is a very different surface, a very different shape but they coexist together and um, we don't pay much attention to that. We might pay attention to the building itself, how beautiful it is or how ugly it is, but not necessarily those joints and those edges that, that make up the fabric of, of things we see. And it could be anything, it could be a, the way that, you know, the phone is sitting on top of a, a glass case. Uh, and for me, those things are, are interesting and, and mm. I think um, there's beauty, but also not in the beauty sense of it, but there's, there's an attraction uh, to me that um, I find it really interesting. Uh, the other thing I like to do is to devoid sometimes objects of their, uh, sometimes of their function and just see them as, wow, it is a, a blue cap of a plastic bottle. I'm not thinking of the bottle of the liquid inside. I'm just thinking of the color blue and the round shape. And, you know, for me, those things, they, they're very marking and, and, and those are the things and those ideas that's what I try to put into the work mm. that are just about the relationship between those um, very sometimes awkward shapes. Uh, sometimes there are spaces in there that maybe shouldn't be there, but they are because that's how, you know, the world is built. <laughs> sometimes the, there isn't that much consideration in terms, or there is consideration, but not, you know, because we so uh, the world is so layered, um, the physical world is so late that we, you know, they cannot all relate to each other in a cohesive way. So, and that's what I try to, to embed in the work is a sense of um, uh, almost uneasiness. They, they, you know, they, they're not uneasy pieces, but I, I, I like the awkwardness of some of the, those relationships between the, both the shapes and the colors. Some are well cut into round shapes, others are just kind of ragged on the edges. And, and that's how things are. <laughs> that's how I see the world. Yeah, that's really interesting. And that uh, when you were talking before about that way that you have that sort of fleeting thing of things going past very quickly. I mean, of course, in an urban landscape, we have a very short depth of field and uh, where you kind of see every everything um, exactly. in quite a lot of detail um, all at the same time. And it, and it does flatten out in the same way that you would get something on a digital screen. And yet you have this very much this insistence of the work being handmade that, that is very different from uh, a computer screen, for instance. No, it's very important to me because that brings it back to the material world and materiality and the way that things, they kind of look. I don't try and repaint things that I see. That's not something I'm not interested in. Um, I'm just interested in creating a vibe of, of, of surfaces of color or things that you might see or the way that things just clash. And this idea of the, um, you can't quite see in those images, but the, the way they are layered, there are lots of layers of paper, they're being sanded down, they're being re-glued and rearranged, and, and, and that's what it is. I, I like this idea that it brings it back. The work itself is a, is a real object. It's not a painting of anything, but actually it's an agglomeration of several layers of things of physical bits of paper that have been painted and cut and um, and we re reused again and, and rearranged in a certain way uh, so yes that the, the materials and um, uh, the mater materiality that's a difficult word for me it always catches me um, um, it, it's uh, it's something that I'm really interested in Absolutely, and it very much comes through. Um, if we think about trace, then, in terms of experience, Hermione Alsop has a slightly different version of um, experience in so far as, I mean, I think of, uh, I, I, Hermione, I think of your spheres as like, 
almost like you're taking a rolling stone through a home or through one's mm. experience of being in a domestic space uh, or, you know, but even throughout time, like, you know, it, it, those houses where multi-generations have lived in. So you might get, you know, a, a, um, like a lampshade from one era and a bowl from another era and one could be ceramic and one could be plastic, but everything's leveled into these almost like fragments of planets or, or something um, like tumbling rocks that have fallen out, that have gathered from their rolling and fallen out from somewhere. They're really quite magical. Can you introduce them to us in your own words? Yeah, so this is a kind of ongoing piece that I kind of continue to make and I started it a while ago, but I'm kind of adding to it. So it's um, creating or gathering more mass as it goes through time in itself. Um, uh, it's called Mantle Deposits um, and they're just numbered, but so they have a, an overall title of Mantle Deposits and the mantle refers, like you said, to kind of like the mantle piece and although the spelling's different. Um, mantle is also a layer of the planet surface, the mantle layer. Um, so there's this kind of, I suppose, this duality and this um, trying to think about how things kind of change and how production, uh, consumption, waste also affects uh, the planet and how we're making our mark. Um, the Anthropocene age um, is now, it means that now that there will be a mark of the post-industrial era in the kind of layers of sediment that is on the earth. So they're also kind of embedded into these kind of spheres or on the surface. Um, and yeah, I mean, I build up works by kind of building up collections of things so all the objects themselves are they have a kind of personal memory significance um, for me that a lot of them kind of uh, a bit like objects um, from grandparents houses or things like that and and I pick them for their material quality or sort of surface something that's kind of resonates with me in a kind of tactile way and I think those some of those things are built up from um my own kind of reminiscences of childhood as well and my and my grandparents houses um so yeah the, there's also the kind of um the element that's sort of somehow archaeological and speaks about time so again they're embedded in a substance um and the substance itself is expanding foam which again is an industrial um element and it kind of speaks about buildings but also it's the kind of the stuff that lurks between the walls and you don't tend to see it so it's like this inside layer so it's um again definitely thinking about kind of interiors and interior spaces and a lot of the objects are usually kind of turned outward so you see the inside rather than the outside embedded um yeah and and for me i thought this piece would be good in the space because um it sort of talks about the personal i suppose and the kind of idea of people making buildings but also that that nod to the industrial and the kind of impact on climate through from production and things like that yeah definitely and uh, do you happen to have an image of the other piece of hermione's as well yeah so this is um quite a different piece the the uh wall piece can you talk about that i've yeah. seen a few of your wall pieces and they they have that much more sort of skeletal kind of in interior sense about them so part of i mean my practice is very process driven as well so part of my practice is while i'm working i'm moving objects around and i'm taking photographs and through that i developed a way of working with collage of kind of cutting cutting things out and then replacing kind of an outside with an inside or something that, so I make these collages, but then that, that sort of led on to this work, way of working with this kind of, in, it's, this is a kind of industrial vinyl flooring that you get, again, you get in kind of um, factories and places like that. Um, 
so the the metal frame was an object I found on the street and it's uh, I think it's probably from um, a sofa or some sort of some sort of bed like structure but it's it's quite it's quite lethal it's got quite hard kind of springs underneath the cushions that I've put on it so the way the way I work with vinyl is often to, to trace and draw around things um, so I create another another layer of it um, and so some of my vinyl works will not have the object as part of them but sometimes I try and work with the two together and in this this case the the vinyl layer it, you know, it has a, this sort of feeling of something being removed or something being part of it, but it also feels like it could be the, the binding structure of underneath the bed. Um, but it also has this kind of element of a sort of sheet moving off it. Um, and then it's also quite um, spatial, I suppose, it's a more spatial way of thinking about it. Um, so the, the, there's a lot of uh, 72 tiny little individual pillows I've made that I've kind of covered the ends of all the springs with. Um, oh, right. So it's a bit hard to see. You have to have, yeah. have a look at it in real life. And so I was, I've, I was, I'm making it at the time of the kind of around the first lockdown, actually, so that there was a lot of visions of these sort of grids of beds. Because I work with beds and mattresses a lot, I was kind of thinking about um, the images of the Chinese hospitals and all the tents being and the beds all laid out. Um, so it, it sort of started to take on something slightly related to that as well. Yeah, they definitely have a, a, a really, really contrasting volume to them. You know, the denseness of the spheres versus the, um, yeah, as I said, you know, more like the, the, spring insides the um sparseness the uh, of the um wall hanging pieces yeah i think what what it is is i try and with the objects that i find or buy or whatever i try and respond to that object so it's always kind of responsive in in that sense so the work then takes on a different appearance I suppose. <laughs> yeah absolutely. Um, continuing with spheres I'd like to move on to uh, Richard Perry's work. Now um, obviously we've got very different material but also I was thinking of Richard's work in a slightly different context than looking back even though there, he does have stories of some of the materials that he uses which are extremely old stone um, which are very much looking back but also, I was thinking of trace um, as an idea of sort of foreshadowing. So rather than, than tracing something backwards, uh, you know, future tracing possibilities forwards. And one of the things uh, I, I thought of um, was this, you know, this, this stone that, that's, you know, an extremely old stone that is stretching to the present day, but also um, nods towards the uh, future and in the context of environmental um, disaster. Obviously, the the saying of being set in stone is, if it was ever thought of as true, it certainly is no longer, um, except by the uh, hopefully minority non-believers. Um, so that really throws up uh, a lot of assumptions that we might have made about our future. And I suppose like Hermione's work, which, which in that sort of rollingness of, um, of, a, of a mantle, of a surface of the earth, um, there is an instability in our future that that the earth has told us about you know for a very long time and it's like it feels like we're only starting to listen and um and Richard I do look at some of your pieces and think of them like origami or you know those kids games where you you know you fold them and um you know you move around and try and guess the ending and yet of course they're in stone so it's like completely opposite materials. Can you tell us a little bit more about your work? Yeah, sure. I, they are quite similar to those sorts of games that, that children 
um, puzzle games, um, but they, they never actually ever make sense. There's always a, there's always a problem uh, or, a, or um, an element that might suggest something that's broken, for example. So, I mean, I, 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 I do like playing with the geometry, um, um, trying to make a, a sort of kind of rational decisions. Um, and then you, you abruptly come to a, a situation where you have to kind of um, just sit back and consider it and, and, and make it a kind of whole somehow that doesn't relate actually to that sort of logical process that you were using. So they, they I mean, it's very process based. They start off um, with one cut and then an, uh, an adjacent cut, and then you have kind of a myriad of possibilities. So um, there's lots of, lots of sitting and thinking and pondering um, and thinking two, three moves ahead and then plucking up the courage to actually make the next few incisions or, or reliefs or bits that stick out or cuts. Um, and they, that might be the wrong decision. You might realise quite quickly that's the wrong decision. Then you have to battle away and rescue it as well. And there's this thing I, I always have about it being, although stone is, you know, most of the, most, most, most of the earth is made out of stone and iron, so, in a sense, it's not um, uh, precious, but it, it does kind of, because it has such a, a length of geological time, does feel very precious to me. Um, so I never actually give up on a piece. Um, I've, I very rarely um, um, abandon a piece. I, I, I battle and battle until I, I find something that's, that's interesting um, to me. And tell me about the uh, black stone that we can see here. This is the stone from Ireland. Yes, it's, it's a beautiful stone. It's, um, it's uh, blue Irish limestone from Kilkenny, um, kind of in the, middle of in the middle of Ireland, I guess, in the middle of the island of Ireland. Um, it's, um, it's 350 million years old. So when, you're, when, you're, when you break a piece or cut a piece or carve a piece, um, you often see a little bit of um, fossil, like it might be a, a, a crinoid stem or a, or a, or a part of a, a shell. Um, and, and that never stops being wonderful, actually. Um, the first time that that's, that's kind of been um, open to the air since, since all of that time ago. Which I, which I really love about, about the material. Um, That's incredibly astonishing. But I also feel that that stone carries with it your experience in uh, Ireland to some degree. Yeah, I had a, I had a fabulous time in Ireland. I, I did, a, I did a, a public art project, um, 2013, I think it was. And I was there for three, three, uh, five months, actually, five months. And I worked in the... The, um, the stone yard um, and visited the quarry a lot and stayed in a house um, that was owned by the, the MD, um, hugely generous people. And since the 1950s, they've had sheds there that they dedicate to sculptors. So, you know, it's, you know, you've got the saws, you've got, you've got the, the, um, the forklifts and willing guys who are familiar with sculptors, you know, just helping you all the time. It's just, it's just great. Mm -hmm. So that also gives me a, um, a kind of, um, I, that's part of the fondness I have for that particular stone as well, that experience. Yeah, yeah I can completely understand. And th they do seem like, um, so you know those emojis that you have of, of the arms, you know how you've got the the flesh arm and the mechanical arm. I I feel these are you know if Tony Craig's paint, uh, sculptures are made for the human hand, I feel these are made for the future mechanical hand or digits or or something. You know. Yeah. 
uh, they're quite, a, yeah, really quite amazing. And beautiful, <laughs> beautiful geometry in them. I'm very interested also in, in, um, in the built environment, um, as, as well as, as spectacular kind of nature, particularly to do with rocks and, and cliffs and outcrops. And I do tend to like drama. So I'll, yeah. I, I'll, I'll be very um, taken with a, a silhouette of a cantilevered building, for example. Um, and those sorts of those sorts of things that crop up, I often kind of find their way in. Um, there's, a, there's 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 always a kind of a I, I seek to have some sort of drama kind of working through the three dimensions. Um, so I'm going to move on to somebody else who's not afraid of drama at all. Um, and this is definitely a very dramatic piece, uh, Lex Foot's work, um, and. I guess, you know, the, if we think again, coming back to trace elements, I mean, the, the sort of scientific de definition of elements is a substance that cannot be decomposed. And I was thinking of that with Lex's work in that sort of persistence that we have of spiritual transcendence, which is actually associated with the right uh, parietal lobe in, in the brain. So, you know, it's just above our right ear. We are, we are apparently um, physically wired to, okay, d I'm just going to do the shortcut to, to look for a God um, or, or have some sort of religious um, um, meaning or spirituality in our lives. And your work, Lex, looks at this sort of persistence, but sees it also through all sorts of, um, you know, really deep and meaningful rituals, things that are very lighthearted um, and the changings of meanings of uh, religious rituals and cultural rituals and their reinvention throughout time. Um, can you talk a bit about this amazing piece of work you've got? Um, yeah, I, I think, all my work is sort of tapping into the, the um, human urge for transcendence, um, especially, particularly from the um, from late capitalism and the industrial, military industrial complex. I think, we're, yeah, we are inherently trying to find some, uh, you know, we're on a quest for meaning. Um, so I wonder whether sculpture can have some sort of spiritual agency and with the material of glass having this inherently transporting quality, um, I'm sort of attempting to move from the material into the cosmic, psychological and spiritual. Um, and my work is kind of um, making correspondences and equivalences across time and space, um, sort of a kind of a cosmology of intent of researchers but um, it's this sort of trans-historical excavation of different cultures to kind of try and create a new one. Um, so it's kind of proposing possible past and futures in this kind of speculative way. If we look through a lens or prism, um, it's a possible parallel, possible parallel system. Um, but yeah, the, the inherent sort of transporting power glass and it's this natural innate visionary uh, it has um, a mystical philosopher Aldous Huxley spoke of in terms of um, how certain classes of objects and materials kind of possess the power to transport the beholder's mind to the other world of vision and I think yeah that's really fascinating to me. And and in this piece, we can particularly see some sort of gateway. Yeah, I, I think of it as a, as a portal to a you know possible parallel or a speculative other world. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of interested in altered states of consciousness and accessing um, alternate realities, sort of parallel universes with deep laws of the cosmos. Um, other worldly dimensions and uh, it's an inquiry into the unknowable. Sorry, what was that last part? Inquiry into the unknowable the, and the ineffable. Yes. 
and also being made of glass and being made of glass in all those small segments. I always get the sense that it could so it, it could all shatter at any minute. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> It's been it. That's another story. But yeah, it's kind of, it's um, strangely, it, at the same time as being um, really precarious and fragile, it's actually quite robust and sturdy as well through the mosaic. Hmm. Um, speaking of alternate realities, um, the uh, um, the light that oh, well we're seeing it now actually um, as the as the light came through the work at different times of the day I, I think I think this is the 11 10 a.m. or sorry the 11 15 a.m. <laughs> view of the work um, it's just astonishing how it interacted with the natural light it was a bit of a I think that's kind of a bit of a Stonehenge moment isn't it yeah Some yeah that's absolutely superb um in a different sort of uh world of glamour or world of yesteryear glamour Sasha Bowles's work um is I suppose to me it recalls a different thing about elements if you know elements are things that are you know seen as essentials um or as prized possessions um, I, I, I think this calls to some sort of persistence of a social structure, which we, you know, kind of see in animals and we see amongst our, you know, really basic selves. And there's a sense of, you know, look, look, but don't touch. And the idea of, I don't know, this, this was a piece that a lot of people, including that princess woman, um, posed in front of, um, you know, right at the end, there was a woman and she was all dressed up like a fairy princess. And a lot of us got a photo of her in front of this piece. And all of a sudden when there's people in front of it, it kind of livens it in a way that you sort of, you know, by putting things in museums and having uh, houses, you know, these elegant houses that no one, that er people can look at but not touch, it sort of deadens the architecture. Um, but there's also aspects of uh, facade in that, Sasha. So maybe you could talk to us about that. Um, well, the, the thing of, of it is that absolutely it's waiting for the performer to come, to come in. Um, and, and as you said, the, with the stately homes, they're there preserved in aspect. And you can go around, but you can't touch. And on the chairs, they'll have a pine cone. And so you're, you're not ex actually experiencing anything of the reality of it. Um, and very often the places have been opened up to the public purely to make an income so that the people can live there and they don't live in the glorious spaces they'll be living in some separate part of the building probably been decorated in the 1960s and then, so there's these other kind of doors and places where you can't go but they can go but in fact it should be the other way around that they should be in the opulent spaces and you so much of, uh, of a little door of, of life and places is a facade and i see how we present ourselves to, to, to the world as players within a theatre. And I guess these, these houses are a kind of um, representation of that. And even at the time, I mean, a lot of the buildings that I deal with are sort of 17th, 18th century. And even at that time when they were built, you were um, able to go and, go and visit them as, a, as, a, as an ordinary, well, not quite an ordinary person but they were open in that way um, and they were done for show. Uh, I mean, within this piece, I've um, incorporated the pineapple, which I have behind me here, um, because Silvertown itself, where the exhibition is situated, uh, made its money from pineapples at a time where the pineapple was almost like the, the, the tulip um, in Holland, where it became this, extraordinary status symbol, symbol of wealth 
and you would, you would take a pineapple with you to a party and not as a gift, but purely to show, to show your wealth, or you could hire it for the evening. Um, and then at the same time, that's when all these carvings, which you'll see in lots and lots of buildings and um, entrances to buildings all around um, London and um, throughout the country of, of pineapples. I'm not sure that answer that you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> Completely. That's so brilliant. Um, I just saying before I accidentally interrupted you that there is a tiny little um, door in this facade that we, uh, I suppose, we imagine is where the owner lives. Um, and, well, and you can, you can, you can see it in many ways, the doorway. Yeah. Mm. So it could be where the owner lives, it could be a way into another world because this is a, a facade, very much so. And if you do go into the structure, which some people do, some people don't, that's completely up to them. It's very much a facade. And when you go inside, it's just cardboard and sticky tape. And photocopy paper. Yeah, the, the images are all photocopy paper. Yeah. And we, we have sugar cubes in this one, which is a new addition. Well, we're in the Tate and Lyle factory, so okay. it may, so I, I wanted it to be to do with the, the site. So um, partly to do with Silvertown itself and to do with the Technal factory. Yeah, and I really enjoyed the uh, reflective pieces on the floor that I hadn't seen before on your work. So when you look into them, um, you're kind of implicated in the whole yeah. the, the, theatre of it. Yeah, well, part, partly it puts you into it and also it, fractures up the space into another space as well. Because part of the process of, of, um, of making the image, I make the whole image originally on a uh, computer screen, and then I have to cut it all up into segments and then put it back together. And invariably, as you put it back together, it's, it's fractured. And that's partly to do with wanting to get a fracturing of time, but also to do with the way that we see things and if you take a photograph, it's a very um, static image or something, and it isn't how we see. When we, when we actually look at something, we're, we're seeing with our periphery and we're moving our eyes and we're taking in a lot more stuff. And so by fracturing the image and layering it and rolling up and seeing other stuff, I'm trying to get a more of a, a feeling of space and a, an actual feeling of how you, how you see things rather than the use that we see things through a screen or through through a camera. Mm. But having said that, when you look at it through through your phone or camera or whatever, it also does another whole thing, which I really enjoy. It because the camera can't understand it, and so it does its own depth of field, and it adds another whole thing, which also connects to the 1971 theme, I guess, in in some ways of that beginning of the world being computers and, and digital and juxtaposing that with, with Disney. And that's very much where my work is between these two things of using the, the modern technology, but at the same time still being very much a child and cutting and sticking with paper. So the, so the 1971 thing by chance happened to, to fit, fit in very much. And it was an amusing thing to say 1971 because he was wearing a t-shirt. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I thought that the, the all that black and white uh, against the colour of the um, of that factory wall, that particular factory wall, is very sort of you know cinnamon and caramel and you know whatever other mm. sort of um, probably toxic detritus is on it. So it gets that real silver and gold look. Um, absolutely beautiful, uh, and plays on those or plays against, I suppose, those um, windows through which we mm. see. Yeah, it, I mean they end up very yellow, yellow and blue, don't they? Yeah. Um, and um, in a different sort of uh, working things out and cutting them up, um, just moving on to Lisa Traxler's work, uh, this had me, uh, I was thinking of this 
I was thinking of trace and trace elements in as many ways as I possibly could. And one of them was that idea of tracing around something, you know, that we all do as kids when we're learning to draw and pretending we can draw a lot better than we probably can. Um, and I thought of that as a way of tracing around something as a means to sort of hold on to an idea or a memory. You know, if, if you're tracing around something, then there's got to be something in the center. Mm -hmm. And again, playing on light um, and, you know, sort of scanning the landscape and reconfiguring architecture. And again, we have the idea of ghosts. Um, Lisa's work, I, I'm going to leave it to you, Lisa, to say how this comes about. But I think the way that this is a, a, a chopped up thing um, that, oh, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? <laughs> but it is, it is a... Um, a segmented composition that only comes together a, as an object, which is quite difficult to know how it's all going to look um, from from where it's it began. So, can you talk about the your process for how these are realised? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so in a way, is this fractured? Um, you are looking at a sort of a fractured landscape, um, and and as you move yourself around and through it it changes, as you're saying, this outline, almost this sort of hand-drawn outline that you could do. Um, and I love this idea then that when you look through between the pieces, they also then are almost um, mimicking the actual painted surfaces. So for me, this came together, um, it was again, another lockdown moment. I think probably for, a lot of artists and a lot of the people it was that that time of silence and that time to be still and all the noise from the outside had just stopped and shut down so um where i live on the isle of wight um on the site where where i live we have a uh, a world war ii decommissioned radar bunker um in our garden and it's the most beautiful thing. So for me, it's just this, this idea of, I suppose the walls and just the structure of it, you can almost feel the presence of how it was built and by whom it was built. So it's um, timber shuttered, poured concrete, and it has the trace of the workers within it. So, so much, I mean, it's just such a beautiful, beautiful, space to be in and the bunker itself has um the bunker itself is an enclosed space underground but the building that that sort of leaps from it is a blast wall area so this area is almost like um it's almost like a courtyard so it's got the concrete walls all around it with a couple of apertures either, either end that you can see the landscape through and it's the most beautiful still, still place. And you just have this open sky above. It's almost like a James Terrell sort of um, installation in a way. And I just found for me during lockdown, that was my place of stillness, my place where I could just sit and just respond to the landscape outside, but be within that blast wall area. And I suppose what happened was because I was there all day long every day because we couldn't go anywhere else. We were we were all sort of stuck in our homes. It, it was just noticing the light passing across this, this shuttered um, surface. And so I used to sketch and take photographs and just literally be with the building for so much of the day. And so these pieces that I created, they're actually called the ghost sculptures. Um, and they're referencing the time that sort of tracing time because time almost hung in that in that area there in that blast wall it was almost tangible you could almost sort of touch that time that had just stopped so i wanted to create these sort of still objects which were of the building themselves as well so in a way they're sort of components that almost jigsaw together they're, they're flat packed so they they slot together and they come apart and they, they stash as a flat pack and then you can reconfigure them and put them together in various ways and I suppose for me it was just that feeling of building building time and, and building what I felt how this building had been made 
So the, the, the actual paintwork on them, I mean, in a way they're three dimensional paintings because the paintwork, they were painted as flat panels and then cut, fabricated and cut and put together. So the painting itself is referencing how the building was made. So a, a steel frame would have been put up first and then the poured concrete would have been put in behind the shuttering. And so you therefore you've got all these layers going on. And then the other part of the paintwork is these sort of diagonal influences, which is the light that was sort of refracting against the geometrics. Yeah, I think it's incredible how I've seen these, this is the third space I've seen these in, and each of them tells a different story. And of course, you know, in this space in particular, because there is so much activity that we've seen, um, so for instance, in Lex's work with the light coming through the window, um, that they really mimic and celebrate the light as well as the shapes of the building, as well as the shapes of the window. You know, mm -hmm. I think the, these become like a micro of the, the bigger sort of shell that we're standing in. Mm. Yeah, this was amazing for me. I mean, how, how they worked with, with the other artists work, but also within that building. So these were obviously made before from, from this glass wall area. But I just love this, the echo of all the framework above. So you've got all the joists of the ceilings and the lines and the sort of geometrics and the diagonals. And then you've got this incredible wall of, of light coming in through those windows. And, and beyond the windows, there's, um, you know, you've got various other bits of architecture and that's throwing light back through in various colors. And so the apertures of the, of the ghost sculptures you almost see this through, these are almost mimicking the windows themselves. So you're almost feeling like you're looking through the apertures of the, the ghosts and then you can see the windows beyond. And there's this idea of this layering of time, I suppose. It, yeah, the way that it's it came together in the building is, and then the concrete floor as well. So it's actually got all the elements of, of where it was born from, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, we're going to move on to uh, questions in a moment. But just before we do, you know, in terms of intersecting with the surrounding architecture and and kind of almost like micro reconfiguration of the space that we're standing in, and as well as uh, apertures, is Justin Hibbs's work. And Justin, I ended up taking so many photos <laughs> through the little peepholes in your work. <laughs> as well as Lisa's work. And we can see them just here. Um, and uh, they become almost, I, I thought of them as like echoes of the larger space that we're in. Um, maybe as a way of sort of um, round, rounding up, if you can talk a bit about um, this work and, you know, the, the, reconfiguration you've done again with the work that we've seen in different spaces of yours and Rosalind's work. Um, yeah, sure. The, um, it's interesting um, what Lisa was saying there about her work and the, these kind of um, views through the, these mirror works were originally created um, with the idea in mind that they, they work, they, they come from a flat sheet of dye bond and I kind of cut V shape scores into them and they, and they fold out. And the idea was that from a flat sheet, you could create space, but in the folding out, you're also framing voids. And so it's this idea that in order to have form, you also need space and that a sculpture needs both things. And so those apertures or those views through, which became much more apparent in this space, which I haven't uh, maybe it's because they're up on stands, so we ended up looking through them like screens. Um, they're really there to describe the idea of empty space, the idea that the things in between something as, are as important as the thing in itself. Um, so that was the kind of idea behind the sculptures originally, but I, I, they are also made in mirror, so that from one perspective, or you know, they're kind of two-faced, they're mirror on one side and they're, they're black on the other. But from the mirror side, the sculpture tends to absorb or reflect the space that it's in. And I, I suppose a more important aspect of that that also goes into what Rosalind and I do that has become really important is the fact that as you approach or you look at the sculpture, that the viewer 
um, inevitably becomes a part of it and they are in the sculpture their own image is in the sculpture so in, in a sense the viewer has to negotiate themselves and what they bring to the work with it and I, I like the idea that as sculptures they kind of fracture the space or you get these different viewpoints so there if you crouch down you suddenly see these shattered images of the ceiling of the space but also somehow yourself as a viewer becomes unavoidable as a kind of idea that you have to approach and I, I suppose that um, very much seeps into the the kind of um, installation works that Rosalind and I make where we create um, kind of this they're kind of large-scale installations with modular elements which we reconfigure and move around <clears throat> to create new kind of journeys through a space or um, I mean we we always make them site responsively and we have different things that we might bring in or out but you know Ros's work are, are the kind of still frame parts and my parts are the mirror parts but we we kind of bring those together and, and play with those as a kind of series of objects in a space that create a journey through a space they might frame the space uh, in other places there's mirrors that then frames the viewer who's choreographing uh or choreographer i can't say the word their own sort of journey through the space so in a sense um it felt really important for this show that um we found a new configuration of that so one of the sculptures is on is on the floor and it sat on this image which is an image of itself essentially um and i suppose it's it it felt really uh, natural for us to to have another iteration of this sculpture which in the past has had different titles like border control so sometimes we thought about it in a more political sense um here it's called reformat um but also it, it it's a way for us i suppose to negotiate the space um but to create a kind of object that um, reflects and absorbs elements of the space or shatters and fractures it. it. It's interesting to hear the other artists speak because there's so many resonances with things that people have talked about, the idea of fracturing space, um, the idea of working with these kind of materials, these different materials. So Ross's steel structures are quite raw. You know, they're left raw, they're not polished. Um, they just clean the corners. Um, and so this collision of different kind of material qualities is quite important for us. So that, you know, they're, they're kind of related objects. And I think that um, it, it, it's been really great to hear the other artists talk at length, a bit more length about their work, because I think, you know, this idea of how um, these objects inhabit this space for us and, and the ideas of time or accumulated histories uh it, it is quite important to the work yeah i mean certainly the accumulated histories uh, plays off the whole idea of trace elements doesn't it because some of these elements of these works i've seen on walls and in other works so the work becomes a trace of its own former self yes um yeah and and i and i think it's um <clears throat> it's something that we talked about in the sort of formulation of the exhibition but it's funny because that those ideas in in theory that you have before show and maybe Rosalind will talk a bit more about this they're they're kind of ideas and actually a lot of the work then happens when you install a show and the way that you put it together and I suppose in our working together something that's very important about that is having learned to um not make too many decisions before you enter the space and try to create something that responds to the space that is different but that works with the space but that will um the viewer will end up having to think about themselves and the space and the work that they're themselves in the work and how they encounter it and i think actually what's been great about this whole experience is putting all those different works and artists together I'm hoping that people will have something of that experience that, you know, thinking about themselves in the space, the space itself, but also how this work works in those contexts. 
Yeah, yeah. So maybe, uh, Roslyn, just quickly, we um, yeah. I want to hear about the installation of the work, mm. but I also want to try and finish on time and have a little bit of time for questions. So maybe you can tell us about what it was like um, to really configure the work in the space. Um, I don't know why it's not switching between us, but that mm. doesn't really matter. Um, I um, everything was made is was basically freestanding sculptures with the exception of um, Hermione and Fabio's um, pieces. But basically, I started with thinking about how we would site things. So Sasha said she wanted to use the stairs and build something around the stairs. So that was a good kind of it was kind of like anchor points, really. I don't come to a show with a fully formed idea. I think that kind of loses some of the freedom of um, expression for me as a curator um, it really has to be about you know a lot of this because of lockdown even though I know the artists work from working with them previously I still hadn't experienced them in their own materiality so it was kind of, it was a question of having certain things that needed to be like um, um, Andrea V Wright needed a wall to cast so that was obviously the back wall and um, so I had these anchor points and Lex needed to have a lot of light with her huge epic amazing glass sculpture um and then it evolved from those kind of anchor points really and playing the space and um i mean that's the exciting part as i say um you know fabio needed a war as i say hermione um and uh and we spent five days there we did three site specific visits or at least i did with different artists uh who could come um, and just thought about it really. Um, Justin's piece here, Trace Elements, that you saw earlier was something that um, really fitted in when we were thinking about the title of the show, because that's from a series called Trace uh, Between Before and After. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and also I think um, it's working with this group of artists has been um, really collaborative and everyone's really considerate of each other's work and um and contributes to the conversation like I don't see curating it for me as being this like just literally being the boss woman um I, I like to talk to people about where I think the work could work and have a conversation and uh, and everyone was very open and flexible to that as well as the kind of ever-changing aspects I suppose of working um on an exhibition like this in a huge industrial space. Um, yeah, so I, I, I kind of start in that way, um, thinking about relationships, for example, with um, Fabio and Hermione, um, which extended out to Richard's um, Perry, but just the kind of way the shapes and materials and colors worked even, um, and how um, those textures as well were really important to think about. And I'm a very, textural person very material um how you look through things and see into things and these are some of the images as you can see that i've taken from instagram um but you, you know we've got um screen dividers here by justin hibbs which were actually really useful because the whole space is open plan and it helped to give a sense of um uh a slight bit of um Boundary. Boundary, yeah. Boundary between us and the next spaces a little bit, not in a sort of we don't want to see any of it, but there's quite a lot of sensitive work. And then we're right next to this huge like orange, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> orange sculpture. So it's just thinking, you know, being sensitive to their space as well as ours, but saying let's have a relationship, but maybe not like a shouty one, mm -hmm. maybe have a more subtle one where you see something in the background, like over here, you can see uh, Luke Sylvan's work in the background of Hermione's on the right hand side where Thorpe Stavry's um, space begins. Um, so yeah, and it's very organic, but the thing that happens before it is I'm just thinking a lot about the relationships between the artist works and the history of the space and so on, as I've already mentioned. Um, I know we're running out of time. Um, I, I did a site specific piece myself as well, um, working with using my still frames to activate the wall in a different way and frame it. And then, you know, placing Richards with, within that was like a really wonderful moment. Um, and that's the joy of it. It's kind of the surprise elements of, the, you know, in my head, I, I know it's going to work. And then I get scared it might not. And then 
and it all comes together. So uh, I think, you know, that's the nature of being an artist when you start a piece of work, isn't it? Just like Richard said, you have to kind of sometimes battle through and think, not that this was at all a battle, but um, kind of keep thinking through, how's this gonna work? How's it gonna work? Um, yeah, and all these kind of amazing materials um, that we had to play with. And just even like the, the kind of proximity of Hermione's to things and placing things within different areas was really important. Um, that's us screening off uh, ourselves <laughs> from the other area. Um, but yeah, and then there was uh, some amazing interactions with um, with the installations. As Sasha said, this is, um, if this works, I can play a tiny bit. This is a, an artist called Darvish. She responded to Sasha's work. I'll pause that, but um, you can see more of that on Instagram at some point. Um, but that was a completely unexpected intervention um, that Darvish did with Sasha's work. He was uh, on a skateboard on a flying carpet around our space during the day. Um, uh, and it was, yeah, amazing. You can hear Sasha laughing in the background there. Um, there's lots of videos of that too. Um, but I think as well with the show, I wanted to create a museum quality kind of show in a very old space and kind of disused warehouse. I, I didn't want to kind of, I wanted to make high quality work within it or choose high quality work within it that would both speak to the building's history, but also be very well crafted and well thought through um, that had a certain refinement. Um, so those were sort of the, the back kind of drop of my thoughts. Mm. But, um, I mean, well, I think it's been really successful and you've got a, oh, you've got a very busy week coming up um, with all <laughs> the activities. Uh, if we, um, oh, you've got them there. Brilliant. I was going to read them out, but that's <laughs> that's much better. Um, does anybody have any questions um, or comments from the artists or comments to particular artists? Yeah, you can all unmute yourselves once you want to ask something, but um, I'll get the gallery view up and stop share. But all of the events from my website and Thorpe Stavries and yeah, we can, I'll just stop sharing so I can see everyone, all of your lovely faces. Thank you for listening. Um, if you if you don't mind, we have a little, I've got a little bit more time on the Zoom. If you can stay, Gillian, or I can stay and build questions. Because um, yeah, as usual, there was a lot, that was amazing. And just thank you to, um, to you, Gillian, and to all the artists that have been so brilliant. And um, Michaela Nettle and Liz Good, who helped with my part of the show. Um, Arts Council England, Fad Magazine. Um, is that everyone? Have I got everyone? Um, yeah, and everyone that's come or is going to come or has come here. Um, yeah, and this is Project who's, who's given the space to Thorpe Stavery to house us all in, um, in what is, I feel, an incredibly ambitious project for everyone involved. But yeah, if, you, if anyone's got any, you can either put it in the chat if you don't. Um, want to say it out loud or you can unmute yourself or if only the artists want to say anything I've got a couple of things if no one does hmm. um and this will be online on my website as soon as I can get it up there but um I wanted to ask you Richard what happens to those fossils once you've found them <laughs> what do you do with them because they're not in the so work in a work is he still here yeah yeah here he is I can't see him he's there Oh, He's sorry. There. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Just repeat the question to me. No, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, I wanted to ask what happens to those fossils that you find that are 350 million years old? <laughs> mm -hmm. What do you do with them? Well, they, they kind of get a bit mashed while you're carving. That's the problem. So 
<laughs> it seems a shame, but you, you, if you if you split a piece of stone, you might see the fossil. Then I mean, you can you could preserve that, but you can't go any further down into the stone to finish the sculpture. Um, so, if you look at the finished work on the surface, you will see thousands and thousands of fossils, um, but they're not that obvious. Um, but if you look closely, you will, you will see them. Some stones are more contrasting than others, but the Blue Irish Limestone, uh, the fossils are quite a similar colour to the its sort of matrix background. Sometimes fossils will pop out, say in a stone like Portland Stone um, or Portland Roche. Um, sort of important London buildings are often made out of Portland Roche, so sort of yeah. Whitehall, etc. Um, and you can see, you can really see big fossils on those buildings, particularly on the the plinth stones, which are usually the harder stones where you find find the fossils. Yeah, great. Um, sorry, did you want to? No, that's that's. <laughs> there was a question on the chat um, from Diane Frost to how is the work chosen? Um, well, the curatorial links and themes I've kind of spoken about in the beginning, so um, we don't have loads of time to go back over that, but it is on the video in the beginning. Um, but in terms of choosing the work, that was very much in conversation with the artists and coming to see the space and how much space we had. Um, and um, there was a lot of, uh, I already know the artists in the show. Um, I've seen either their work in exhibitions or I've worked with them before. Um, so I already had a sense of, of what they might want to suggest or bring. Um, and so it was like, bring things and you can always take it away. Um, so yeah, Richard bought more sculptures than he thought we might have space for, but we actually did because of the way they interacted with other pieces of work. So it wasn't just like one huge um, block of Richard's sculptures. It was about them reacting to other things and 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 vice versa. Um, but yeah, the curatorial themes was about material materiality and transformation in brief. But yeah, you can read more about it either online or by watching the YouTube. Um, any other cues? You can wait. I was just going to say that um, the, uh, the, you know, ac across all the different curatorial groups, uh, there were different ways of approaching the, um, the each individual installation. Um, and the, you know, yours really did avoid that thing of, you know, having one piece by that person and one piece by that person. It really does become a trace of, you know, uh, fractions and elements and fragments within the space. It, it does what it says on the packet. <laughs> I'm very pleased to hear it. <laughs> um, and uh, also just as well, like with um, Sasha's, the sugar cubes in the World War II, um, when all the men were at war, all the women were looking after Tate Null, uh, factory. So it's kind of nicknamed the Sugar Girls Factory. So Sasha using mm -hmm. the blocks of sugar in her work is again, very site specific historically as well, which I thought was really, uh, when I was sharing information with the artists about the history was a wonderful way to kind of respond to it. But also, you know, even within that, there's so much loaded history within sugar and, <laughs> colonialism, stately homes, and so on, <laughs> that could be unpacked at a later date. But um, it's an interesting way through to history, I think. And there's a nice little foreshadowing of um, Richard's work in that corner with your work, uh, Rosalind, that you showed at the end, because there's a big, um, looks like an oil stain on the ground. Yeah. Mm. Actually, it looks like a shadow of the work. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A nice bit of uh, elements of surprise when you're working with a building um, is that you can play with those elements too. And um, I think even when you see in context of what Sasha was saying about her work with a fire exit, <laughs> with all this paper, this flammable paper near the oil, near to the prehistoric stone next to the steel, um, 
you know, the more that you inhabit the space when you're curating, and I kind of always encourage people to be in the space as much as they can, because you start to see new relationships going on that when you're installing, you don't always see at first, but you're like, oh, um, you know, and the way that even the artists have been sharing photos of their different images, like Fabio sent me some images today of these textures and can totally see how this building will then re-inspire him to make new works too. And all of us really, I think. So um, that's the thing. It's a conversation that continues, the endless conversation with us, with the building, with the past, with the future, uh, and with you all, I hope. So, yeah, thank you. Absolutely. That's a lovely note on which to finish. And congratulations again to you, Roslyn and Justin, and all the artists that were involved. And thanks, everybody, for being here. And good luck. Best wishes uh, to you all on all your endeavours and see the show and come to one of the other events. It's really worth it. <laughs> Thank right. you so much, Gillian. Thank Ciao. You, Gillian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, bro. Bye.